Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and use it to validate the truth of creation. My name is Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. And I have with me today a very special guest. Dr. Danny Faulkner is with me. And today we're going to talk about whether we had a big bang or whether we have a big God. Is that right? Yes. So tell us uh, what you brought for us today. Okay, well, Don, the, the dominant theory of, since the 1960s for the origin of the universe has been the Big Bang. The idea that billions of years in the past, the universe that includes matter, space, energy, and time suddenly appeared very hot and began expanding up to what we see today. And that, as I said, has been the dominant theory for, for decades now and almost no other competitor around there. One question I have is, you know, does this really fit with Genesis? Does this what Genesis uh, tells us the way the world began? It does in one sense that there's a beginning, right? Yes. It does show that there is a beginning. That would be an argument many would use, yes. There's yeah. one point of commonality we have here. Okay. But uh, there are other problems you, f you find as you go along. You're going to tell us that the more you look into the details, the less the Big Bang Theory has to do with a biblical worldview? I think so, yes. Good. All right, well, help right. us understand that. Okay, I like to do kind of a historical development when I talk about the Big Bang. I want to talk about the assumptions, how we got to be where we are, and how the model came about. Okay. And so it's good to go back to the ancient Greeks. They had a lot of ideas about, uh, about astronomy and about uh, other things in the world around us. They kind of invented science in some respects. And the ancient Greeks believed the world was eternal. Matter was always was. Matter and space, everything had always existed. And there are a couple of reasons they, they believe that. One was that they couldn't imagine the world coming into existence by itself in a physical fashion. Indeed, that's real hard to ponder, as you might imagine. But the other was their gods were really inadequate to describe this sort of thing. Their gods weren't transcendent. They weren't much more than supermen. So if you have little gods, you've almost <laughs> got to have eternal matter, don't you? Yes, you do, because you see their gods were born, they right. d lived, and they died. Right. Nothing like the creator God of the Bible who is transcendent outside of his creation entirely. So the two things are interrelate. Go yeah. ahead. And so then you find that this idea persisted well into the 20th century. You know, even after Christianity became the dominant belief uh, in the West and even uh, created science as we know it, this idea that the universe was eternal uh, persisted amazingly late. As you already pointed out, this idea of eternality of the universe is contrary to what the Bible tells us. So I think these uh, scientists of the past who believed in, uh, in God, believed in the Bible, but also believed in an eternal universe really missed something because they it's let their science... It's hard to overestimate the influence of Greek philosophers like Plato yeah. on early Christian writers. Isn't Absolutely. that true? And even yeah. later. Yes. For instance, I'd like to talk about Newton. He okay. invented gravity or gravity. the theory of gravity, I should Got say. Got hit on the head with an apple. Uh, a well, fig, I think. Okay. All right. But uh, uh, he thought the universe is eternal. He writes his Principia. He gets his theory of gravity. And he applies his theory to gravity to the entire universe. And if you do that, you find out that there's a center and everything has had plenty of time to coalesce towards the center into a big ball. And you look around, that's not the way the universe is. It's very extended. So this does not match what we see. So in Newton's <clears throat> mind, the universe was getting smaller? Well, gravity would do that. Gravity it's tends to... Pulling things in Yeah, together. because everything yes. pulls towards the center is what would happen okay. with Newtonian gravity. It's pretty obvious that it would work that way. And uh, that's not what happened to the universe, so we had to figure out a way to get around that. Now, the easiest way, and I think the correct way, would have to realize the universe wasn't eternal. But the other way he got around that is he assumed that the universe uh, was infinite. And what that means is if you go off in this direction, or if you go off in that direction, infinitely far away, you've still got matter and space ahead of you there. There is no center around which all the matter could coalesce. It, we have what we call a static universe, a universe that's not contracting in on itself. So he starts off with the eternal universe, and with his law of gravity, he ends up with, with an infinite universe. And this idea then persisted for a couple hundred more years. And then the early part of the 20th century, a guy named Albert Einstein comes along. And Albert Einstein puts forth the current theory we have of gravity of general relativity. And it's kind of complicated, but basically space itself and time is curved. And that curvature of space and time makes us see accelerations of gravity and things like this. You got all that? Uh, I'm trying to, but uh, <laughs> how does that change? Well, it changes the way we look at gravity. One thing that uh, Newton was trying to do was have gravity work through empty space. The sun is here and the earth is here and somehow the earth knows where the sun is and it uh, telegraphs that information through empty space about where the sun is, how much mass it has and so forth and the earth moves accordingly. This is mysteriously telegraphed through space. We call it uh, action at a distance. What Einstein was trying to do was give a mechanism 
through the curvature of space and time to telegraph that information. Okay. And there are some differences between Newtonian and Einsteinian gravity. Uh, one thing that you find is even if the universe is infinite in size, it still will tend to coalesce into a, a, a heap at some point. You got back to the same problem you don't really fix anything. You right? don't fix the problem that Newton fixed by yeah. saying the universe was, was right. infinite in size. So you have a real problem there. And the way uh, Einstein fixed it is he introduced this thing we call the cosmological constant, indicated by a Greek letter lambda. And this is sort of a repulsion term. Space is pushing back against the contraction of gravity. If you fine tune those, you get, a, you get a universe that's neither contracting nor is it expanding. It's again static. So you still have the pull, but now you have a push, push. that's sort of. Counterbalance New that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Neutralizes. All right. And later on, by the way, Einstein said that was the biggest blunder he ever made. A little harsh, I think, but on himself, but that's what happened. But at any rate, uh, this then becomes the, uh, the model. And then we have a guy named Edwin Hubble who comes along in the 1920s. And he made two great contributions to astronomy. In 1924, he was able to prove that there are other galaxies. We had known about our own Milky Way galaxy in which we live. But he showed that there are others in 1924, besides our own th billions of other galaxies, actually. And then four years later, 1928, he argued that the universe is expanding. When you go back to, uh, to Newton and those guys, did they think we were the only universe? Most of them did. Yeah. There was a big, big debate that raged really through, uh, starting in the 18th and all through the 19th century. Right. From about 1880 to 1924, almost everybody thought that our universe, our galaxy was it. There was nothing else out there. But since Hubble, we know literally there are billions of universes. Billions and billions. And you're going you're to show us yes. some of those. So I'll show you a couple you of those. Yeah. Great to have you do this for us, Dr. Falken. <clears throat> By the way, this is a, a photograph of Hubble uh, working at the telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory above Los Angeles Basin in the San Gabriel Mountains. A uh, beautiful facility there. Uh, this is a photograph of the telescope. At, for many years, at the time he did his work, this was the largest telescope in the world. There's a 100-inch uh, diameter mirror down here. And up here at the top is a secondary mirror. And you could put some instruments down there. I think the photograph we saw of Hubble was down here at the bottom of the thing. He did great work uh, back there at that time. Here's a photograph of a, of a galaxy. This is the closest one to us, similar to our own. This is the Andromeda galaxy. If you can spot it with your naked eye, it requires a dark, clear evening. Uh, you can actually see this thing with the naked eye, the most distant object you can normally see. It's about two million light years away from us. Contains a couple hundred a billion stars. There's a little satellite galaxy here and here. If we could get outside of our own Milky Way and look at it, we think it would look a lot like this. And if we call this a spiral galaxy, it's a very common type of galaxy, very pretty. Here's one called uh, M104 or the Sombrero Galaxy. It's about 30 or 40 million light years away from us. And again, lovely spiral galaxy. I uh, like this one a lot. This is a, a barred spiral. It has a bar running across the middle of the nucleus of the galaxy. And so that's a, just a very pretty uh, galaxy. And what he found, there were billions of these galaxies out there. But in 1928, he started measuring how fast these things were moving away from us in space. And he produced this diagram. This is actually a reproduction from his 1928 paper. And what he's plotted vertically is the uh, speed with which the galaxies are moving away from us and horizontally the distance. And you'll see these dots here and a couple of lines drawn through them. And the, the lines show you the trend there that as the distance gets greater, the speed with which it's moving away from us gets greater. So the further away from us it goes, the faster it goes. That's it. And why is that? That's because we think of the expansion of the universe. Okay. As the universe expands, things have to get farther away, and things that are farther away are farther away because they've been expanded more. Okay. It's one of those things that actually was predicted by Einstein's uh, theory. When you take away the cosmological constant, you're then left with the universe that's either contracting or expanding. And which ones it's doing is a matter of observation. You can't deduce that theoretically. And Hubble knew about that. And that's what caused him to do this, this pioneering work so back in 1948. So Einstein is what motivated Hubble, is that right? Absolutely. He knew the work Einstein had already done on that. Okay. And so they have several other people about the same time. A fellow named De Sitter came along, and he put together some theories. He showed that using general relativity, that's the theory that Einstein came up with it, right. If you, um, you either get the universe expanding or contracting, it's a matter of observation, as I just mentioned. And Hubble showed in 28 that expansion is the proper thing that's going on. And uh, the guy named Alexander Friedman, he's a brilliant Russian mathematician and cosmologist, he uh, got rid of lambda, said it's equal to zero, and he had a whole series of models we call the Friedman universe. And that was really the dominant model until about 1999. So it had a long shelf life, about 70 years, most people believed in a Friedman universe. 
And also about this time, um, a guy named Lemaitre, he was a Belgian priest, he was a physicist, he uh, developed what he called his cosmic egg. His idea was the universe began as a tight ball or mass of, of energy and, and matter and then rapidly expanded, that egg kind of hatched as it were, and this produced a finite age. Now he was trying to get a biblical sort of creation, as you mentioned before, having a finite age rather than an eternal universe. And this early model that, that Lemaitre invented eventually became the Big Bang model. That was a name that came about in the 50s, probably. The modern version was actually deduced back around 1948. This is where it begins. Yep. A French monk named Lemaitre. Uh, Belgian. Belgian, Belgian monk Belgian. named Lemaitre. Uh, and the idea is, is that, uh, again, he was trying to prove creation in his own mind. Everybody else after him, for the most part, they were just trying to, to get a model of how the universe began, whether it uh, was God or whatever. That was their approach to take Did, did he use the term Big Bang? No, Big Bang actually was coined by uh, Sir Fred Hoyle. Okay. Uh, he was a critic of right. this model, and he uh, used it as a term of derision, right. and the alliteration stuck. It's actually a terrible name, because it's not really an explosion, uh, if you understand the model, but the name has stuck, because it just uh, really is an interesting name. The uh, alternative that came along, Fred Hoyle was one who believed what we call the steady state universe. Back to this eternality, what they had here was as the uh, universe is eternal, didn't have a beginning. As the universe uh, expands, it's going to become more rarefied. So they simply said, well, if it became more rarefied, eventually we would have infinite uh, extension of everything and have zero density. So to maintain uh, a universe as we see it, they had to have a constant density. And the way you get around that is just hypothesize that matter spontaneously comes into existence to maintain constant density. And have you ever seen that happen? No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, it's Go just ahead. one of those things you'll hypothesize. <laughs> we could spend more time talking about right. how somewhat reasonable this might be. You're going to have to trade conservation of energy and mass for conservation of density. It's a switch of what you want to be your fundamental. But again, it's not been, been observed or confirmed at all. And this was uh, very popular right into the 1960s because you see, you go back to eternal universe. Right. No beginning, no end for that matter. Now, in the 1960s, a great discovery was made. Or I don't have time to talk about it, but it referred to the uh, background radiation, the leftover, if you will, from this early time in the universe. And that was uh, what caused people to uh, begin to embrace the Big Bang and drop the steady state model. So since about the mid-1960s, late 1960s, this has been the only game in town for the most part. The, the steady state theory is truly an atheistic theory. I've not found anyone yet who endorsed this theory who was not an atheist. But it's now been proven totally wrong. Well, to most people's satisfaction, but uh, there are... There are still some folks absolutely, out Absolutely. People still believe in a steady state or some other form of it. Okay. Because they really want to persist in this eternal universe. All right. Now, uh, many Christians take the Big Bang as part of their apologetic. They say, as you pointed out, well, the universe had a beginning. The Bible says the universe has a beginning, so therefore this must be the Genesis creation we're talking about. So the universe did have a beginning. The Big Bang had a beginning to that. Uh, and so they ask the question, who or what began that process? They want to suppose that God is the thing or the agent that started that uh, had taking place. We also point out that some of the Old Testament passages uh, talk about the expansion of the universe. I have here Psalm 104.2, Isaiah 40.22, Job 9.8. There are others that talk about this expansion, stretching out the, the uh, heavens like a tent. And this is maybe possibly suggestive of expansion of the universe. So it seems to be biblical. Yes, okay, but, but the thing yeah. is, the, the, the point I want to make right now is the fact that the Big Bang is not the only possible sort of solution that you can have. Uh, you can have other, other theories, like steady state for that matter, right. is, a, is an explanation of that expansion. So the Big Bang is just simply one possible uh, explanation of many uh, that one could have. And there have been some claims from Big Bang apologists that uh, this, this sort of fact has led many astronomers to turn to the Lord. I don't see a lot of evidence of that. You move in this circle and you haven't met those people. No, I, I find people who already, already are Christians who then like that. Yeah. But I've not personally known anybody who became a Christian because of this. Okay. I'm, I'm not saying it hasn't happened. I'm simply saying it's overstated many times by people. Now, um, my assumptions are a bit different from that. Before we continue with your assumptions, we need to take a break. So you, uh, you need to hear uh, Dr. Faulkner's assumptions and uh, why he's not buying the Big Bang as God's theory for our creation. So don't you go away. We'll be right back.
Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Danny Faulkner, is also the author of Universe by Design, an explanation of cosmology and creation. This is an excellent book for upper-level homeschool curriculum or the library of an astronomer. Orders are being taken at 1-877-CRSBOOK. Dr. Faulkner has a degree in math, his master's in physics, and a PhD in astronomy from Indiana University. He is school professor at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster, where he teaches physics and astronomy. For more information about our guest, you can write to Dr. Danny Faulkner, 1402 University Drive, Lancaster, South Carolina, 29720, or send him an email. We're back from the break and we're here with Dr. Danny Faulkner and we're talking about do we have a big bang or a big God. Now Dr. Faulkner, right before we went to our break, you talked about the assumptions of the big bang apologetic and how some Christians had hoped this would bring some compatibility between uh, the evolutionists and the creationists and you're not so sure. Is that right? That's correct. You'd given us the Big Bang apologetic, and you were going to give us your assumptions. Okay. Would you continue with that? Okay, well, I, my first assumption is I'm, I'm presuppositional. We agreed we're, we're both presuppositional. And one of the results of being presuppositional is that uh, the Bible's authoritative. That's right. We all know that in spiritual matters, but you know what? Those, the authority also it extends to historical matters. And we are talking about the past, so it is a history. Do you realize how many historical books there are in the Old Testament? The first 17 books are. That's right. But uh, let's see, the book of Job, with the poetic book, is still a history book. And you look at the prophets, most of those contain a fair amount of history. Almost the entire Old Testament is history. So it is historically accurate, I do believe. And so I, I think if it's... If it isn't historically accurate, it isn't accurate at all. It, right. can't, it can't be wrong on those things and still be right on spiritual things because there is no divide. That's that exactly right? correct. Yeah. And my main point here is that Genesis is a book of history. It's a, the word Genesis means beginnings. Right. So if we, as a Christian, we want to find out how the world began, it behooves us to go to the Bible first rather than second or, or third or fourth. I'm with you on your All methodology. Right. And, uh, you know, the Genesis account tells us that the world began in six normal days. And you could do a whole program or a bunch of programs on that, but I think we're pretty well agreed that the best reading is six normal days, and I think there's not a good way to get around that, actually. And if you do the chronologies found in the Old Testament, you end up with an age of the world about 6,000 years. I don't necessarily endorse the 4,004 you find in the Usher in chronology, but I don't think it's very far off. I don't think the accuracy, though, could be, uh, could be that well established. And so I asked the question, is the Big Bang biblical? And I'll just give you a few questions, a few objections uh, that I have. One of them is the fact that uh, the Big Bang says that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago, give or take 1% or, 1 or so. And yet we find in Exodus 2011 that uh, in six days was the earth and the heavens and all that in them were made. That seems to include the stars and the rest of totality of the world as well. A lot of people would tell you that that's a fact, that we can measure from the egg how much it's expanded and that, that there's no room for debate there. What do you it's say to that? Model dependent. Okay. It's model dependent. It's model dependent. Model uh, dependent. Yeah. In fact, when you get that uh, simple age, many times you have to massage it with some sort of assumptions that you put into the model. And uh, so it's a good age, it's just a very model dependent age. If the model's correct, then the age is indeed correct. But there are a lot of assumptions in there sure, to get absolutely. to absolutely. That. Okay. And, and that's true of any, I mean, I'm making assumptions here too. But, but facts aren't necessarily facts. A lot of times they contain, what, what's said to be a fact contains a lot of assumptions. Absolutely, and science is particularly and true. True here, yeah, yes. Okay. Absolutely. And then beyond that, uh, we find that uh, in the standard Big Bang cosmology and what follows from that, that many stars uh, were made over a long period of time preceding the creation of the Earth. According to modern ideas, the Earth is about four and a half billion years old, uh, which makes it a Johnny come lately because the universe is 13 and a half billion years old. So you've got nine billion years in which many stars were created. And yet Genesis 1, 14 through 19 says that the Earth, well, it says the stars were made after the Earth was. The first thing God created was, was the, the Earth. Earth. Heaven and the Earth. And heaven meaning atmosphere. Or even space, we're not entirely certain what okay. exactly that means. All right. But, but not stars. No, day four. Before you have any stars. The stars All are three right. days younger than the, than the Earth. And also, I think the Big Bang is an ongoing thing. We think it was a past event, but we're still living with the repercussions according to the model. It's an ongoing thing, just like biological and geological evolution are ongoing things. And yet, uh, the end of Genesis 1 and beginning of Genesis 2 makes it very clear that this is a finished product. God's finished, and He's not doing this uh, sort of work anymore. Now, does that mean the, the, is the universe still expanding? 
Yes, the universe the is still The stretching out that you talked about is still happening. If that's what it's talking about, okay. it means expansion. I'm not okay. entirely convinced that's what it means. And then uh, a big question I have is where do you place the time? I'm talking about 13 and a half billion years. Where do you place that when you look at the chronologies and the six days of creation? You can have day age theory, allegory theory, all sorts of things. And uh, we could do many different shows on just that question. Sure uh, but the, 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 uh, the, the upshot is I've looked at all the ways you do that and I'm, I'm convinced that all of them are lacking uh, biblically. And then I like to talk about the Big Bang. I like to compare it, the model, what, it, what is today, what it was uh, 25 years ago. How different was it back then? Well, several things are different. One is that the expansion rate was different. Uh, in the early 90s, they decided that the expansion rate was wrong. And that then gives you a different age, of course, when you do that. Also, there's this thing that came along in the 1980s called inflation. Back 25 years ago, you didn't include inflation in your model. Inflation is this idea that early, early, early on the Big Bang was this very fast expansion that took place. You inflated the universe up very okay. quickly, and it was used to solve a couple of problems that they had in the Big Bang model, which we haven't had time to talk about that yet today. There's a thing called dark matter out right. there. Uh, 25 years ago, you didn't include dark matter in, in a model of the Big Bang, and there was no dark energy. Remember I said up to 1999, they had yeah. Friedman universes? Mm -hmm. Well, in 1999, they dragged Friedman out and brought back in this thing. They now call it dark energy. Remember the lambda of the cosmos was constant? Right. It's back. <laughs> they now call it dark energy. No string theory. This is an idea about how particles work. Uh, very speculative theory, not any evidence for it, but almost all physicists are convinced it's a true theory. Uh, now, I give you these five different things that are so different from 25 years ago and today. 25 years ago, they had complete confidence that the theory was correct. Today, they have complete confidence that the theory is correct, even though the theories have almost no comparison to one another. I'm certain of one thing. I have no idea what the Big Bang model will be like in 25 more years, but I'm sure they will have complete confidence in that theory no matter what it is. Do you call that faith? Yes, I also call it a very plastic model. You can change and shift this theory. Uh, it's absolutely to, right, but it keeps changing. And you, cannot, and you can't disprove it. Right. So it's not really a theory right. at all. I right. call it a theory, but it really isn't if you understand what theories really are. And how does this compare to Scripture? Scripture doesn't change. The Lord doesn't That's change. Right. And so we're taking this changing idea of men, and we're trying to make it trump or interpret the unchanging nature of God and His Word. And I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. And uh, what happens uh, with your apologetic here? What kind of problems can you have with that? Well, uh, it's a changing apologetic. It's a moving target, as we just pointed out. Uh, but also, it's, I think it's contrary to Scripture. Those questions I raise are very important questions. And here's a very important one. What happens if we tie our apologetic to the Big Bang? Well, you know theories in, in science come and they go. This has had a shelf life of decades now, but I, I think eventually people will, will discard it and pick something else up. I have no idea what it will be when it comes along. But if we've attached our, our apologetics for Scripture to the Big Bang model, then when the Big Bang model goes down, what happens to our apologetics and our Bible? Sum that up for me in one sentence. What are you saying to our people today? The Big Bang is not compatible with Scripture? Absolutely. It's not okay. compatible because of the questions about timing involved, which, which came first, uh, the stars, the earth. Is it really compatible with Scripture? And the only thing they have in common is they both have a beginning. But there's a lot of detail that one has to look at. And we have detail given to us in the first chapter or two of Genesis, which I think is incompatible with Big Bang. You know, one of the things you say that as a, as a pastor and uh, hopefully as a theologian that resonates with me is that it isn't real science if it always changes. We, have not, we don't have scientific fact. In fact, you're saying we don't even have theory. We just have hypothesis. Is that an idea? I wouldn't even we, call it a hypothesis. Yeah. Yes. These theories and these suppositions are going to come and going to go, but the Word of God has withstood and always will. And I need you to remember that you can trust God and trust His work. Dr. Faulkner, it's so good having you with us today. And viewers, it's been great having you as well. And I want you to remember this above everything else. It's God's view that He created you. And that should always be your worldview too. Hope to see you again here on Origins. Until then, God bless you. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. 
To get a copy of the information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1104 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1104, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.